Welcome to Journey Evidence Theat. And this is um, something, a program I'm really looking forward to because we're in the heart and soul of Weaverville, North Carolina. And we are joined by the guest, Rob Mangum of Mangum Pottery. And we're actually in his studio, which is considerable. What would you say? It's two floors, or it's two floors. It's two floors, and and we're we're in the in the in the muck and and the of clay and minerals and all around us and in the atmosphere. And there's all his uh, his work, some finished, some unfinished, and. Um, this is going to represent that part of art that involves um, working with physical raw materials, uh, sculpture, clay, and all the rest of it. So we're going to start with my usual uh, linear chronology, which in your case, Rob, is quite goes back a ways, doesn't it? Sure does. So you're one of those artists who um, learned your craft and your art through family, through generations. Is this true? That is correct. My mom uh, started making um, stuff out of clay. Actually, she started just doing flea markets. She was doing, you know, corduroy pillows, whatever she could do. But clay was one of the early things that she started working with back in the uh, late 60s. Huh. And um, by 75, she had a pottery business. And I was uh, a part of it. You were part of it, so you were. But you, but you told me, I think, if I remember correctly, that it goes back even further. That your grandparents were potters. No, no, no. Um, uh, no my 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 uh, my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, was from Oaxaca, Mexico, okay. which is a big pottery area. Yeah. But we don't know the the family from down there, and so okay. we don't. I don't really know if that's if there was a connection. And actually, it was my mom that was the one that was originally into it. It sounds like it. So this would have been 1975 when you... 75, 75. was, yeah, I was 10, and, and she started doing shows with her pottery, and um, one of her first little items that she did was a, a little honey pot that had a poo bear on the top of the okay. lid, and I made the poo bears. And you made the poo bears, and how old were you at this time? I was 10. 10. Yeah. And what were the materials at that time that she and you were working with, just in terms of... Um, uh, you know, methods. Well, I mean, very similar to what we do here now. It's the same uh, as today. I mean, okay. We were working with uh, stoneware clay um, uh-huh. and um, and glazes. Um, uh, my mom started her business with um, with an electric kiln, and so oh. she was doing kind of a mid range. Uh, and now, you know, we have a we have a gas kiln here, so we're doing a higher fire. But uh, but very similar. What what is it like when you're a, a child who's learning from your your fa- family, your parents, uh, a craft like that? What is that experience like? I guess I, I suppose imagine it's in some ways different than saying going to a school to learn something or having someone who's not family be a mentor. So it's more in the family. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Is it in terms of it's it's around you because it's in your home and then and, you know you're absorbing the practice, right? And so that's... Yes. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, I feel like I got to absorb, uh, uh, you know, my dad, we were living in Charlotte first, and my dad was an insurance claims adjuster. My mom, mom was a school teacher. Huh. And um, and so my parents um, in the early 70s made a life, a choice of a life change to move to the mountains. Mm. Uh, and my dad was, uh, he wanted to be a musician and he started apprenticing under, uh, a, an, an instrument maker and, um, we started going to music festivals wow. and, um, and so, um, they were hippies and they, um, really didn't know what they were doing. They hadn't studied it. They were just doing it and they started taking, but they started taking workshops. My mom started going down to John Campbell uh, folk school 
and uh, and doing workshops at the folk school and um, fortunately, I was got to be, I got to tag along. We went to Charles Counts' uh, 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 studio down in uh, Rising Fawn and took workshops, wow. and um, and just got I got to I got to get a part of that education as a kid just by tagging along at these workshops with my mom, and uh, but then yeah, I got to watch them also struggle. Mm. and not know what they were doing. So, and, so wait, let me, let me uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a question about that. So you're saying they were not knowing what they were doing, but they must have known something. So so what I mean is, you. so you have a background in music as well as pottery, obviously, because your father was learning how to learn how to make instruments. What were the instruments that he was trying to, well, he, he was, was making? It was uh, the Sturgill, uh, uh, Uncle Dave Sturgill's guitar shop. It was a guitar okay. shop. And he made guitars, and uh, they were a bunch of scruffy hippies that yeah. uh, my dad and his buddies that, that apprenticed under Uncle uh-huh. Dave Sturgill, and there was always... And so we moved to Piney Creek, North Carolina, and I uh, was going to Piney Creek Elementary School, and when we had been in Charlotte, I actually wanted to play in the symphony. I wanted to play violin. And my um, the opportunity for that went away when we moved to Piney Creek, North Carolina, in Allegheny County, North Carolina, which was... At that time, extremely rural, mm-hmm. still is very rural, but um, but it was a thriving rural community. Okay. Um, but there was no symph- symphony. Yeah, and but I mean, Art Wooten, who had played uh, with Bill Monroe and was a, uh, had won Union Grove Fiddlers Festival uh, 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 a number of times, lived in a trailer right next to Piney Creek Elementary School, so I could get out of school, go take my lesson, my mm-hmm. fiddle lesson from Art Wooten, wow. and then walk down to the guitar shop. And there would be music playing in the guitar shop. And so in a way, you were on track to being a musician, I guess, or at least, or at least that was the. It seems like that's one of the directions you were going in. If you're, yes, you know, associated with the, those the, folks. I mean, the first yeah. studios uh, that my um, that the first studios that my parents had were mostly instrument studio. Wow, and the little pottery studio was kind of off to the side. And then huh. um, as my dad started his own business and was making banjos, his focus was making banjos. And, but he started making pottery, and it turned, he turned out to be really good at it, and he could throw big pieces, and he enjoyed working with my mom, and they, made a great, they ended up making a great team. Um, and they did struggle, though. They, uh, I mean, I remember I went, went down to North Wilkesboro with my dad. Yeah. We did uh, the chicken festival one year. and we What went was down the chicken there. festival? It was a... F- uh, because ho- was it Holly Farms chicken that was in North mm-hmm. Wilkesboro, and so this was on the Wilkesboro Motor Speedway in the infield. It was a little art, a little cr- craft show called the Chicken Festival, mm-hmm. and we went down and did it. And we didn't sell; we sold one mug at the end of the day. And I think mm-hmm. back in those days, our mugs were five dollars. Wow. So we made five bucks, and huh. all day. And I think my dad ended up leaving a director's chair that he had. He, it, it, I think he it was a loss. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, you know, it's a, it's a long, long learning curve to for for to figure out how to actually make a living doing it, you know, uh, with 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 the with the pottery. And by the time I was in college, um, and I was working, I came home from while well, I was in design school at NC State, and I used to come home all the time and work. Oh, you went to design school. Went to design school. And they have a good design department. Got I mean, that's known design. around the, the country, the world. Oh, yeah, that's where Beth and I met. We were both okay. in Syme dorm. She was upstairs and I was downstairs and she was a freshman. I was a sophomore. And Well, at that, at that time, what were design students studying? What were the curriculum like there? I mean, in terms of just, well, yeah. what were you expected to know or have acquaintance with? The well, traditionally. Textiles or wood or any, all of it or any of it? Or? Traditionally, that school had been a uh, architecture school, an architecture, strictly architecture. Um, uh, but you know, during the fifties, you know, when Buckminster Fuller and all these other people came involved with the school and they ended up splitting off into, uh, product design and then landscape architecture. And then out of the product design department came a graphic design department, which is kind of where I started out, uh, in graphic design, ended up getting, get a, a basic design degree, but, um, but it was, uh, it was great. It was a great place for us to be, and um, you said that you made the uh, was it the bears when you were a child? Uh, Pooh bear, you said Pooh bear. What was I did yeah. make Pooh bears. What? Uh, what about the journey between that and you're making your own a mug or making your own sculpture? Talk, talk about that because because there's a there's a journey that that goes from when you're st- going from 
doing simple things, you might say, and then actually over time making stuff. So that interests me. I mean, what in terms of what that? Well, I mean, what I learned from making those Pooh Bears was, I mean, at a very early age, I learned how to produce because, you know, when my, that was my mom's first uh, big selling item was the, the honey pot and she yeah. sold a lot of them. And so I used to have to make these little packs. I would take a plastic bag and I would put a row of four and then roll it over and put a row of three and then flip it over and put a row of four and there'd be like a, I don't know, like 15 or so bears in this pack. And then I would put them in a, in a, in a clay box and I would stack them up and there'd be a, you know, a couple of hundred bears in there for my mom to, so that when she made her honey pots, you know, she, she could just go and access because they were wrapped up in plastic. They would, they were ready for her to work with. And so really that taught me at an early age of, you know, how to like develop systems of being able to, uh, to, to produce things. And even now, like for me, I still have to come up, like you were saying, I, I, I have to come up with creative new ideas all the time. I'm always having to, you know, uh, with, with my business, but every idea that I come up with and eventually ends up having to become a, um, something that's producible. If, if it doesn't, I mean, it has to relate to people. Sure. People mm-hmm. have to respond to it so mm-hmm. that they, they, they want to take it home with them. But also, uh, it has to be something that I can easily produce because I can't really like make a living just making one of these. You right, know? of course. I've, so I've, you're saying it can't be a one-off. It has to be something of which there are several or many. Like that's the figure which, sculpture. The figure sculpture that I like so much. Yeah. Them, you know, yes. Um, that... Yeah. Um, that piece, uh, you know, I, I, I went through several different d- design I mean, uh, just... variations to try to get it to a, a place where I liked it. And then, you know, I have, and now I can make those. And, um, and you know, when one, when one sells, I can produce another one. And I can do them in different, uh, different surface treatments and all yeah. of that, you know. But, uh, but that's how you make a living out of it, from it. Well, of course. But I guess what amazes me is that journey from, from the bear to a full bigger sculpture or a mug or that's a that seems like a lot of that's a that's a that's quite a development so i guess it's just years of, of work right i'm going and sort of that's right yeah you know, i mean and i guess i guess stravinsky said uh, perspiration not in, more than inspiration right did he say that's right yeah he said 90 90 percent perspiration. perspiration and 10 percent inspiration that's right yeah yeah <laughs> well i mean just like with an instrument just like with playing a playing music uh um when you learn how to play an instrument some people are going to be inspired and some people are going to be talented and have you know just be really blessed right off the bat you know to like be able to find the notes on this instrument and have a sense of uh rhythm and meter and all of that but still it's still it's a long-term relationship it's it is it takes the longer you do it the more you know about it the more you educate yourself the more you practice and uh and yeah working with clay is is the same thing clay is very working with clay and glazes but just working with clay alone is uh is a relationship that you develop and 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 hopefully it continues to evolve over time well you mentioned 1975 and of course that's when mk richards wrote centering i think that's right and that's was that Talk about the importance of that book for people that do what you do. When that book came out, it was kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh-huh. um, my yeah, my mom bought that book when it was when it was brand new, along uh-huh. with a number of other books. Um, and and um, who was it, M.K. Richards, and what was that that um, the significance of centering uh, that you could? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. Okay, I um, <clears throat> I read the book one time when I was in my twenties, and. Um, at that point, I was already like, you know, I mean, it's kind of an existential uh, 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 a, a look at, at working with clay, mm-hmm. and I know it had a huge impact on my mom, mm-hmm. and so possibly th- through her, it has had a big impact on me. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other books that she got that bought back in the early seventies that dealt with uh, processes mm-hmm. and, um, you know, uh, uh, and just. It showed processes I, yeah. I spent more time with yeah. and was more uh, influenced by, I would say. Production, you produce a lot. We do. And it's impressive. I mean, I come in here, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, is there, is, is that, does that change through time volume? 
or speed or is it is it a constant or does it depend on season or it is seasonal um we have our slow season of course during uh during the the holidays Mm -hmm. i mean after the holidays during the winter that was our slow season um and uh so yeah our 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 season is kind of shaped like a teardrop in that you know the year is slight at first and it gets fatter and fatter and fatter till the end it's kind of shaped like like a hershey's kiss maybe (laughs) and then like after after december it cuts off so you meet beth your wife in the school design Mm -hmm. and she she's a potter Right or yes, she Beth uh she grew up in northern Virginia and she um uh wanted to work with clay from an early age. I think her mom was not didn't think that a young lady should be working you know she was trying to kind of steer her towards like painting and and other types of artistic endeavors and so mm-hmm. when she uh took classes at the torpedo factory uh she actually didn't take the pottery classes and she was in fibers. Okay. Uh, at uh in fiber de- fiber design at uh at NC State the school of design and and uh yeah and so when when I started my pottery business uh she was fascinated that you know that and and just jumped right in started working with me from right from the very beginning that's fantastic uh did did she continue with on in fibers or did she put or did she move over to him? she has continued on in fibers as a matter of fact if you see these these uh, 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 hampers are full yep. of, of fibers, uh, samples, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. She's a quilter, and mm-hmm. this room that we're sitting in has been used to make uh, many uh, community quilts oh, for wow. like people who were getting married and well, people sure. who were uh, um, uh, having babies and stuff like right. that. Uh, she's not doing as much. She, she did make a quilt a couple of years ago. It's kind of a, a hobby for her. Mm-hmm. What are your feelings about craft itself? Because um, I know that you you seem to really love clay and know about clay. Um, so we could talk about clay. What are, what are the properties of clay that make it unique? That make it unlike other other materials and and make it best suited for what you're going to make in the end? What what anything that comes to mind about the- well, yes, definitely. Um, the clay particle itself uh, is um, the kaolin particle. Mm. Uh, which is this hexagonal little platelet that uh, has amazing plasticity. And plasticity is what makes clay, you know, the fact that you can stretch it is, uh, is just too much fun to just... just um, everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. School, go take my lesson, my Mm -hmm. fiddle lesson from Art Wooten and then walk down to the guitar shop and there would be music playing in the guitar shop. And so, in a way, you were on track to being a musician, I guess, or at least, or at least that was the. It seems like that's one of the directions you were going in if you're yes. you know, associated with the, those the, folks. I mean, the first yeah. studios uh, that my um, that the first studios that my parents had were mostly instrument studio. Wow! And the little pottery studio was kind of off to the side. And then, huh. um, as my dad started his own business and was making banjos, his focus was making banjos and. But he started making pottery, and it t- he turned out to be really good at it, and he could throw big pieces, and he enjoyed working with my mom, and they made a great, they ended up making a great team. Um, oh. And they did struggle, though. They, uh, I mean, I remember I went, went down to North Wilkesboro with my dad. Yeah. We did uh, the Chicken Festival one year, and we what went What was down the Chicken there. Festival? It was a, uh, because, ho- was it Holly Farms Chicken that was in mm-hmm. North Wilkesboro? And so this was on the Wilkesboro Motor Speedway in the infield, it was a little art, a little craft show called the Chicken Festival, mm-hmm. and we went down and did it, and we didn't sell. We sold one mug at the end of the day, and I think mm-hmm. back in those days, our mugs were $5. Wow. So we made five bucks and huh. all day, and I think my dad ended up leaving a director's chair that he had, he, it, it, I think he, it was a loss. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, you know, it was a, it was a long 
long learning curve to for for to figure out how to actually make a living doing it you know uh, with, with with the with the pottery and by the time i was in college um and i was working i came home from while well, i was in design school at nc state and i used to come home all the time and work oh you went to design school went to design school they have a good design department i mean that's known design. around the the country the world oh, yeah that's where beth and i met we were both okay. in Syme dorm she was upstairs and i was downstairs and she was a fresh when i was a sophomore and well at that, at that time what were design students studying what were the curriculum like there i mean in terms of just well yeah what were you expected to know or have acquaintance with the well traditionally textiles or wood or any all of it or any of it or traditionally that school had been a uh architecture school an architecture strictly architecture um uh but you know during the 50s you know and buckminster fuller and all these other people came involved with the school and they ended up splitting off into uh product design and then landscape architecture and then out of the product design department came a graphic design department which is kind of where i started out uh in graphic design ended up getting get a, a basic design degree but um but it was uh it was great it was a yeah. great place for us to be and um you said that you made the, uh, was it the bears when you were a child? Uh, Pooh Bear, you said Pooh Bear. What was I that? did yeah. make Pooh Bears. What, uh, what about the journey between that and you're making your own a mug or making your own sculpture? Talk, talk about that because there's a, there's a journey that, co- that goes from when you're st- going from doing simple things, you might say, and then actually over time making stuff. So... That interests me. I mean, what in terms of what that? Well, I mean, what I learned from making those poo bears was, I mean, at a very early age, I learned how to produce because, you know, when my that was my mom's first uh, big selling item was the the honey pot, and she yeah. sold a lot of them. And so I used to have to make these little packs. I would take a plastic bag and I would put a row of four and then roll it over and put a row of three and then flip it over and put a row of four and there'd be like a I don't know, like 15 or so bears in this pack. And then I'll put them in a, in a, in a clay box and I would stack them up and there'd be a, you know, a couple hundred bears in there for my mom to, so that when she made her honey pots, you know, she, she could just go and access because they were wrapped up in plastic. They would, they were ready for her to work with. And so really that taught me at an early age of, you know, how to like develop systems of being able to, uh, to to produce things and even now like for me i still have to come like you were saying i i i have to come up with creative new ideas all the time i'm always having to you know uh with with my business but every idea that i come up with and eventually ends up having to become a um something that's producible if if it doesn't i mean it has to relate to people sure people Mm -hmm. have to respond to it so Mm -hmm. that they 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 want to take it home with them but also uh it has to be something that i can easily produce because i can't really like make a living just making one of these right know? of course I, so I, you're saying it can't be a one off it has to be something of which there are several or many like That's the figure which, sculpture the figure sculpture looking. that i like so much yeah. them, yeah. yes um that yeah. um that piece uh you know i i, I went through several it's different d- design I mean, uh, just... variations to try to get it to a uh, a place where I liked it, and then you know I have, and now I can make those, and um, and you know when one when one sells, I can produce another one, and I can do them in different uh, different surface treatments and all yeah. of that, you know. But uh, but that's how you make a living out of it from it. Well, of course, but I guess what amazes me is that journey from from the bear to a full figure sculpture or a mug, or that's a that seems like a lot of that's a that's a that's quite a development. So I guess it's just years of, of work, right? I'm going and sort of... That's right. Yeah. That's, I mean... And I, guess, I guess Stravinsky said uh, perspiration, not ins- more than inspiration, right? Did he say... That's right. Yeah, he said 90, 90% perspiration. perspiration and 10% inspiration. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just like with an instrument, just like with playing, a, playing music, uh, um, when you learn how to play an instrument... Some people are going to be inspired and some people are going to be talented and have, you know, just be really blessed right off the bat, you know, to like be able to find the notes on this instrument and have a sense of uh, rhythm and meter and all of that. But still, it's still, it's a long-term relationship. It's, it is, it takes 
the longer you do it, the more you know about it, the more you educate yourself, the more you practice. And, uh, and yeah, working with clay is, is the same thing. Clay is very, working with clay and glazes, but just working with clay alone is, uh, is a relationship that you develop and, and, and hopefully it continues to evolve over time. Well, you mentioned 1975, and of course that's when M.K. Richards wrote Centering, that's, I think. That's right. And that's, was that, talk about the importance of that book for people that do what you do. When that book came out, it was kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, um, my, yeah, my mom bought that book when it was, when it was brand new, along mm-hmm. with a number of other books. Um, and, and, um, who was it, MK Richards and what was that, that, um, the significance of centering, uh, that you could. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. Okay. I, um, I read the book one time when I was in my twenties and, um, at that point I was already like, you know, I mean, it's kind of an existential, uh, uh, uh a, a look at, at working with clay mm-hmm. and I know it had a huge impact on my mom. Mm-hmm. And so possibly th- through her, it has had a big impact on me. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other books that she got that bought back in the early seventies that dealt with, uh, processes mm-hmm. and, um, you know, uh, uh, and just, that showed processes I, mm-hmm. I spent more time with yeah. and was more uh, influenced by, I would say. Production, you produce a lot. We do. And it's impressive. I mean, I come in here, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, is there, is it that, does that change through time, volume, or speed, or is it, is it a constant, or does it depend on season, or? It is seasonal. Um, we have our slow season, of course, during, uh, during the, the holidays. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, after the holidays, yeah. during the winter, that yeah. was our slow season. Um, and uh, so, yeah, af- our 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 season is kind of shaped like a teardrop in that you know the year is slight at first and it gets fatter and fatter and fatter till the end. It's kind of shaped like like a Her- Hershey's kiss, maybe. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm. like after after December, yeah. it cuts off. So you meet Beth, your wife, in the school design. Mm-hmm. And she she's a potter, right? Or yes, she Beth. Uh, she grew up in Northern Virginia, and she um, uh, wanted to work with clay from an early age. I think her mom was not didn't think that a young lady should be working. You know, she was trying to kind of steer her towards like painting and and other types of artistic endeavors. And so, mm-hmm. when she uh, took classes at the Torpedo Factory, uh, she actually didn't take the pottery classes. And she was in fibers, okay. at, at, uh, in fiber de- fiber design at uh, at NC State the School of Design, and and uh, yeah, and so when when I started my pottery business, uh, she was fascinated that you know that, and and just jumped right in, started working with me from right from the very beginning. That's fantastic. Uh, did, did she continue with on um, fibers, or did she put, or did she move over to? She has continued on fibers. As a matter of fact, if you see these, these uh, 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 hampers are full yep. of of fibers uh, samples and stuff mm-hmm. like that. She's a quilter, and mm-hmm. this room that we're sitting in has been used to make uh, many uh, community quilts oh, for wow. like people who were getting married and oh, people sure. who were uh, um, uh, having babies and stuff like right. that. Uh, she's not doing as much. She she did make a quilt a couple of years ago. It's kind of a, a hobby for her. Mm-hmm. What are your feelings about craft itself? Because um, I know that you you seem to really love clay and know about clay. Um, so we could talk about clay. What are, what are the properties of clay that make it unique? That make it unlike other other materials and and make it best suited for what you're going to make in the end? What what anything that comes to mind about the, well. Yes, definitely. Um, the clay particle itself uh, is um, the kaolin particle, mm. uh, which is this hexagonal little platelet that uh, has amazing plasticity. And plasticity is what makes clay, you know, the fact that you can stretch it is, uh, is just too much fun. To just, just, I mean, you get it in your hands and you just squish it and it feels good. So you love it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, as far as the material itself um, is is wonderful to work with. Now, of course, we also work with ceramics. Because ah. after you make something, 
That's a different whole different, different thing. Talk different about bottles. so that's interesting to me. So clay versus ceramics. So what do you, any thoughts about ceramics and doing that? That's uh Well, yeah. I mean, you you I mean, anybody who's done uh pottery or, or ceramic sculpture has had the experience of a uh, <clears throat> you you work at it, you work at it, you, you, the thing flops and flops, and finally you make, if you get on the potter's wheel and you, you, know, you finally you throw, you throw this piece and you're so proud of it, and it gets bisque fired, and then you got to glaze it, and probably you're going to mess it up. Hmm. I mean, it's a good chance that you're going to mess it up, unless the person who's showing you how to do it is basically holding your hand through it to a point where you don't. I mean, because there are so many elements of of working with glazes where, I mean, because a glaze is, might have some of the clay particle in it, but uh -huh. it also has uh, a lot of feldspars. It has silica in it. It has uh, limestone derivatives. Huh. It has heavy metals in it, like iron or cobalt or, or copper. <clears throat> and they're all suspended in water. And so you stir that glaze up, you apply it to the piece, and then you got a couple of other glazes that you put on that piece, and it all has to the, the application, the thickness, the uh, the, uh, the um, and then the temperature that the kiln fires to, the atmosphere in the kiln. There are a lot of variables that go together to make the surface of a piece. And you really came good. to ceramics after clay? Is this true? Well, because uh, because I I mean, as a kid, I I produced for my parents. I mean, right. I produced all the way through college, high school, and college. Mm -hmm. I I uh, you know came up with n new creative ideas that my you know my dad was always pushing me to come up with new creative ideas while I was in design school. What's it, What's an example of something he he pushed you, and then you came up with this thing that you we felt was unique at the time that. Nobody had anticipated that it comes to mind. Yeah, to um, well, I mean, there uh, are uh, some of my signature pieces that are down there in the, in the display right now are actually pieces that my my uh, after I came home from my freshman year at design school, uh, my dad was like, okay, well, let's put your design school education to work here and let's come up with some new ideas. And he's like, I, need, I want you to design me uh, a new teapot, a new pitcher, and some new vases. And so I busted out my sketchbook and started doing a bunch of drawings. So you draw? Well, you have to draw. You have to draw. Every, every idea that I've ever... Uh, you, uh, the only way you flesh out an idea is by sketching it. So you see visual... I mean, you, you think visually. You, you're a visual person. You see things that a I'll less you, visual person may not see. You I'll tell you one thing. So interesting. Was, one thing that was really... Uh, that, that I guess uh, uh, one of a uh, really benefit of me growing up in... Allegheny County, North Carolina, and going to Allegheny High School, uh, which is very remote and had uh, very little opportunities. We didn't we didn't have an art teacher. There was mm -hmm. no art teacher, um, but there was a drafting department, and uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, mm -hmm. the drafting teacher, was was great. And he uh, there was architectural drafting, and 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 then there was mechanical drafting, huh. and that's what I was interested in. And so I took his mechanical drafting program further wow. than any, I mean he ran out of things to give me to do and he like we would just come up with things for me to draw and so that really I mean that plus then going off to design school yeah I mean like the idea of like having an idea drawing it down draw out like 10 or 20 different variations and then I show them to Beth show them to my employees and they're mm. like I like that one and that one but this is a little weird and I go back and I draw them all again that's like just the, the figure piece. I mean, that's that's how I came up with that piece. I, I mean, there's a couple of pages of drawings that led up mm -hmm. to the idea that you know of that piece, and and so um, that summer of 1984, mm -hmm. uh, yes, I sat down, I drew out a bunch of ideas. He critiqued them. We did some more drawings. Eventually, I got to the point where I made a bunch of templates and came up with some designs of pieces that not, that I could then come back and produce for for them. You know, later, you know, but it starts on paper, correct? It starts yes. with the with the drawing, mm -hmm. and so that has to be, in a certain sense, right before the next step. I guess I'm making it three dimensional. I'm making it in the yeah. world. Yeah, interesting. Well, and that is really different from. I mean, the way I work with clay is kind of different in that uh, I I throw on I can throw on the wheel, and I did all of my throwing for a number of years when I first started my business before Beth did, but mm -hmm. um, I started slab building. When I was 10 years old, I mean, hmm. I started slab building 
or like right off the bat. That's very young. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, my, yeah. my parents had a book. Oh, wow. A, a book called The Penland Potters. Huh. And it had um, had uh, Toshiko Takiezu, Bruno Lavierde. It had uh, uh, the Larsons, Tyrone Larson mm. gave a, a demo, a photo demo of, of how to cut slabs out of a ball of clay and roll them out with a rolling pin and like make mm. this box. And so I made one. I think I was 10 or 11 years old when I made the first one. And I think my dad an, immediately saw an opportunity and and early on like kind of encouraged me and pushed me to kind of keep coming up with new designs and stuff like that. And so basically, unlike when you sit down on a, at a potter's wheel, when you sit down on a potter's wheel and you can plop a ball of clay on there, I mean, it really does help to know what you're going to throw before you plop it down. But you can kind of follow your muse and just throw, you know. But basically, you, it's best to know because, you know, you, you open it up, you pull it up, and there's a spontaneity to, to what happens on it. Whereas with the slab building, it's a design process. I mean, I, you know, I, I come up with this thing. It's got all these facets to it. And, and you know, it's, it's a little more of like an engineering thing. It's an engineering. Does it, so that's a difference to you between one and the other. I know that I, I, in my limited knowledge about the world of uh, tailoring, uh, like this sport coat I'm wearing now, tailors in, in I guess, Salvador tailors have a phrase called rock of eye which is when they do the cutting without reference to, they do it, I guess, freestyle. You call it freestyle. That's, they have a whole term for working that way. I don't know if it relate. It might relate, but, but, um, so yeah. Yeah, totally. That's um, interesting. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, for myself, I have to be able to like visualize square. In your mind's like, eye or in the, yeah, I, can, yeah. I have to look at something and, and see if it's balanced. Hmm. It has to be physically balanced, but it also has to be visually. You have to you have to be able to see it. So you have to be able to see and feel the distribution of mass through this piece, so that it's balanced. You know, and that's a very very similar to what you're what it's you're talking really about. It's really interesting. So, I guess what I'm struck by is you go through the world with a different set of eyes than I have, because I'm not. I don't see the all these things that you're seeing so when you're going throughout the day i'm sure that you probably when you're looking straight ahead you see something you probably see when something's a little off or maybe something's symmetrical or not asymmetrical do you so that's interesting oh can, it's a curve it can be a curse. Uh, like um signs for example oh yeah like people have poorly designed signs for their businesses and it, they drives, do? it drives me crazy and yeah, you like, notice it yeah, you can notice that the kerning or the letting is not good, or you know, just the, the typography is, or, or their logo doesn't communicate very well. And huh, <laughs> it's like a, you know, I always notice that. Interesting. And is that something? Is that would you say that's in partly from birth and partly training, or, or about a little both maybe? Or? I think it's probably just because I'm OCD. You are okay. I mean, I I, mean, I don't know if I'm di- diagnosed OCD, but uh, I mean, yes. So God is in the details, I guess. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, is there anything else that comes to mind about that experience of of, of meeting Beth and then have, and then forming this here? This is in Weaverville, and this is an impressive accomplishment. And you also run concerts every year, and you do do art art and autumn, and you do so you do all these things. How I guess what I'm always how are you able to <laughs> how are you able to do all the things you do? Is like so you kind of got a got a really gift for organization, I think. Too, well, right? you know, it's not something that I I wanted to do. And not something really? that I set out to do to huh. be a community leader. I mean, it was like uh, I—I um, I guess what happened. <clears throat> I was always drawn to um, putting my studio in an old commercial building that had the potential to do retail out of. From my very st- first studio in Raleigh mm-hmm. to the one we had in Bloomington when I was in graduate school mm-hmm. uh, to um, to you know to this building. Uh, and when we moved into this building, uh, Weaverville was, um, it was, it was, it was a pretty dead little town. A lot of these buildings were boarded up. Like I was telling you before, there was a, a lot of structural, like what I was showing you guys, there were a lot of places where this building was structurally failing. Um, we rented the building for what would now be considered ridiculously cheap. Uh, but it had never been heated by anything other than wood. It didn't have a furnace in it. Uh, the, the roof leaked, uh, there was no wiring, and I had to put some money into it as a tenant. <clears throat> and um, over 
the over the years, you know, we've developed things like we started, like, you know, there were some some folks like the bed and breakfast kind of wanted to start this art safari to draw attention to how many artists were in the area. And so we started the studio tour. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of started this business association to kind of, but even before that, in the Southern, we, we had, when we first moved here, I had gotten involved with the Southern Highland Craft Guild and ended up being on the fair committee and then serving a couple of terms on the board of the Southern Highland Craft Guild because my parents had been in, involved. I was second generation potter, you know. It was, That's right. It was, it was, uh, and that was a good experience. And then as Weaverville took off, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we started the business association. We started doing art in autumn. Yep. And when we started doing art in, art in autumn, I mean, Beth and I did craft shows for years. I and mean, we traveled and did shows. We used to have years where we did 20 shows a year. 20 shows a year, and you're traveling throughout the South or the Tennessee, through, Georgia? Yeah. And when I was in graduate school in Bloomington, Indiana, we traveled throughout the Midwest ah. and did shows, even while I was in grad school. You um, went to grad school in Indiana? Got an MFA in ceramics. That's beautiful. I love, I miss Indiana. It's been a while. My, my, my dad grew up in, uh, he was a Hoosier, grew up in... Uh, oh, yeah? In, uh, in, the Indiana, uh, in Indianapolis, so... Um, hmm. Yeah, Southern Indiana yeah. Uh, is, is, is great. You know, we, we totally enjoyed being in Southern Indiana, and uh, it's kind of like the South. I mean, you know, you, all you got to do is go to Indianapolis, and you're in the Midwest, but Southern Indiana is hilly and, hmm. you know, close to Brown County and all that. And, yeah. yeah, Bloomington was great, and it has a great, a, a big music school, and, uh, yeah, and the music in Bloomington, I mean, that was the best thing about me going to graduate school was uh, the music. there was so many great uh, ethnomusicologists. And, and, and Dave uh, Baker's and, there. Uh, I don't oh, know the that, name. That, yeah, you know I, David Baker? Yeah, he's a, he's a jazz guy. They've been there for 30 years. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know many yeah. people in the musical. Yeah, I know um, uh, Josh. No, no, what's... No, I, I know some people from the music department, but but um, it's been a long time. It's been 20 mm. years, but mostly <laughs> it was people from the anthropology to program the huh. ethnomusicology program that were into into uh, you know traditional music from you know that's right and and uh and so it was a great period of time for me and i ended up doing a body of work that was a bunch of instruments uh i don't know did, did you see my banjo i have seen it i can look at it again so yeah i mean i i actually I made a bunch of sculptural that. instruments beautiful. that were kind of based on some stuff that i learned from being being in grad school in bloomington but um Back to what I was saying, I was, I was just saying that, uh, yeah, having uh, the, re- the the potential retail potential here, and then and then starting to develop that and grow that, and then starting to do things, yeah, and like putting on art in autumn, uh, and having all the experience that we've had with doing shows, we were able to kind of put on a show with a lot of experience from from that I've grown up with, grown up doing, and also there's a couple of other business owners down here who also have a lot of experience who have a wonderful committee. And so it just naturally worked mm-hmm. out that I was actually booking the bands for, for, for that event because I also uh, play in several bands around Asheville That's and right. I know all, all these musicians. And when I heard you playing oh, and heard yeah. how great you are, oh. uh, it was like, it's, and I, by the way, uh, um, you guys uh, sounded awesome. Yeah, we at, enjoyed doing at, that. It's a, ever, it's at a, Art and Autumn. This yeah, year. this is recently, right? Now. So, what was the turnout usually? That was a good turnout that day, wasn't it? You know, the like a thousand chief, people or something. <clears throat> no, no. Police chief said he thinks we had over ten thousand people here that day. That's fantastic. But, yeah, uh, and so, um, you know, the police chief, of course. Yeah, you know, it's a small town. It's a small town. Where did you develop your skills with people? You, I think you're really good with people. You seem to know how to organize things really well and to do this it takes a what is it just i don't well, like know I, just, said, I, th- I don't think it's something that i really set out to do i think i just kind of uh naturally fell fell into some of these responsibilities of, of mm-hmm. and, and then and now and, and because i've I mean, we maybe just also because we do retail and we have to s- smile and talk to people yeah every it'll day. do it you know, like yeah. all day, every day, every you know? all day, every day. Yeah, and um, and and also just you know, working with uh, with all of that, it's like um, I think it's just something that you know, something that you develop, just like uh, just like practicing your instrument yeah, every and, day. Yeah. yeah, that's working fantastic. With clay. You're working with clay. Yeah. So you do clay and ceramics both, right? Yeah. You said you came to glazing late. Is this true? Well, or yeah. relatively late. Well, only because uh, as a kid, I and and all the way through, I was I was worked. I was mostly <clears throat> involved in uh, in in helping you know my dad with product development and 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 producing. 
And so when I started my own business in 89, um, I uh, had never glazed any of my pieces. Mm -hmm. I'd never done the high firing process. And that summer of 84, we built a wood kiln out at Turkey Knob. And also mm. during the 80s, uh, my dad and I started getting into doing Raku. Uh, um, I mean, and so Raku is another firing process cool. where um, you pull a low fire piece out of the, out of the kiln and, uh, and you put it in a combustible and it causes a surface. It mm. ca you can get, basically you can, you can pull a piece out of one of our bisque firings that's fired to 1800 degrees and it's still very porous and you can throw it in a, a pile of st straw or sawdust or newspaper and it's going to catch on fire and you smother it with a bucket and all of a sudden, <clears throat> uh, you rob that atmosphere for oxygen. You pull all the oxygen out of the piece and impregnates the piece with carbon, turns the piece completely black. Hmm. And that's, you know, that's the, basically the Raku experience. It's really fun to do. And we got into it. What makes it that and, fun? Just the process or the chemistry of yeah, it? Yeah, you're outside. You're doing yeah. it. So it has this kind of a carnal, like, fire kind of thing going on, huh. you know, um, just like wood firing does uh, or similar to how wood firing does. But um, so, yeah, during that period through the 80s and then when I started my business, my dad and I were really adventuring being very adventurous with with a lot of different firing processes and um and uh, uh so there's more techniques. than one clearly you said firing process is plural there's it's different infinite. ways it's infinite i mean what you well, can do with clay and how you can the different kinds of surface treatment i mean if you just look i mean there's this area this area that we live in is one of the most amazing areas for for pottery and for crafts and like yep. I mean, just Weaverville alone is Absolutely. over 200 potters that live in just mm. Weaverville alone. I mean, they're just you know, they're mm. I mean, the, Buncombe County. I wouldn't even guess how many the Asheville area mm. has. And if you look at everyone, I mean, everybody everybody has their own their, their own take on it. Mm. Everybody's doing their own thing. That's great. You know, and there's room for as many more to to come and find their own. Take so on it's individuality it. built into the process. Yes, definitely. That's a. It's a beautiful thing about it. Um, and, of course, we live in a time now <clears throat> where people can choose mm. to do what they want to do, which is so different. You know, I mean, uh, of course, this this profession of working with clay, of, of ceramics, of, of, and working mm. with clay goes back, you know, 20,000 years. You know, it's one of the oldest professions that, that man has, uh, done. has, has done. And, yeah. um, mm. and uh, for uh, up until probably the 18th or 19th century, no one had the choice of what they were going to do. They were families of potters and like they were, they were yeah. and, and there yeah. were multi-generations and then yep. people, there was apprenticeship mm -hmm. and there were uh, mentors and, and pe mentors and, and there, there was a, yeah. a, a set thing, uh, uh, you know, product line that, 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 you know, fit the needs of that culture mm -hmm. for me, you know, and, of course, now we are in a time where, um, you know, people can, they can choose whatever they want to do with it. And, and as long as it, as it resonates with, with other people mm -hmm. and especially with, you know, Instagram and, uh, uh I mean, yeah. just the, the, uh, you mean new technologies and social media, Turk social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can find their, 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 their market, you know, and people can find what they're interested in. And so mm -hmm. like, you know, just, uh, um, the, uh, I think that, you know, the the diversity is well there's there's infinite room for for new diversity that's fantastic well rob um i hate to do this but i'm gonna have to say goodbye soon because <laughs> all good things come to an end and this has been really a treat i learned a lot i mean i learned things in this uh, show that i didn't know before coming in here and it's really uh it's it's really a, an honor for you to uh, allow us to enter your space, uh, which is quite beautiful, and talk about what you've been, what you have done, and what your family's done, and and the art of it. So thank you well, for, thanks, for being on Journey of Anesthete and uh, uh, continuing what you're doing. Thanks for having me, Mitch. It's, it's an yeah. honor to to be on your show. I, I love your music, and I thank like you. your show. So thank you. To be continued, then. Thank you. From the time I was about five or six, I loved making art. Five yeah. or six? Yeah. I was that to like, me is very young. I mean, that's incredible. Well, I loved, I loved working in the kitchen and I loved making things. And uh -huh. so I, somebody said, 
oh, you could be an artist. And I just sort of latched onto that notion uh -huh. and um, just kept that in my heart as what I was meant to do. And um, my parents were a little freaked out about it. Um, they were. Now, why uh, is that? Who were they, well, they just were, you know, oh, that's, you know. I, they just didn't have, they weren't acquainted with anyone that was a professional artist. And so that, that was what, why they were concerned. I mean, they just wondered, like, what kind of a future I was going to have pursuing that path. And it's not really, um, you can't really judge them for it. They just have no right. acquaintance with it. And sure. they were... My mom kind of got onto this thing like, oh, you're gonna, you want to be an artist, you should marry a rich doctor and paint, or, you know, like, <laughs> that was her, <laughs> she's from a different era, right. you know, that and was the she, then. yeah, and she never w entered the women's movement, mm -hmm. um, so she, uh, she didn't have a career of her own, she was, uh, I mean, my dad was an attorney in, in D.C., and that was the life that she had, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, anyway, so, I, so I, your father was an attorney. Mm -hmm. What kind of law did he practice? He was a natural resources lawyer. Interesting. And uh, he has he had a big firm in downtown DC, which is still going. He, my dad is gone, but but the firm is still going. So um, he worked mostly with natural gas legislation. Huh. Um, so that was his his career. He he started out as an engineer, and then he ended up in that field. Um, and so, when so I was, you knew what you wanted to do. You're you're five and six, and then so did, would you would you say that I the just I just point? kind of was like, oh, art is my thing. Art is my I, and I actually feel like uh, my I love being a maker of things. Mm -hmm. I I'm not gonna say I don't believe that I have a huge amount of talent. I don't. I mean, I feel like my talent is is being able to throw and be able to sit there and do it for a very long periods of time. And that's a, that's that's not something everybody can do. It's kind of like a zen thing. Like, I could stand there and make 50, yeah. 60 mugs yeah. in one spell swoop. 50 or 60 in a, at a time. Oh, yeah. Even more. I could do 100. 100? I mean, I might be a little bit dizzy. When we, when we <laughs> were starting... When we were but, starting this uh, podcast, we said this show is, is from the people who make things. Uh huh. That was our tagline. Okay. And here you are saying that you what? Say it again. You you like to make. I things. feel like my talent is in the in the ability to uh, make a lot of the same thing at one time and like to to actual. I like I like the tactile process of making things. Um, and that's why I've never had any of my, I, I do have, I have got a, a lot of assistance from these wonderful people that work here that make uh, bowls and, you know, help me trim stuff and, like, make it possible for me to, like, complete all this, you know, vast amount of stuff that we make huh. in here. Um, but I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm more, I'm like a, I've got that sort of, workhorse zen thing down <laughs> that's my that that is what i like to do and i i love um <clears throat> i love the decorating of the pots and um that's really awesome i'm kind of veering off of uh what uh, that's what i'm doing now but if you want to go back and want me to go back up and talk about my childhood and my ev evolution as an artist or Absolutely. If you're offering to talk about that, I'll take you up on that. Okay. That's, if it interests you, it interests me certainly. Okay. Yeah. You know. Well, um, all right. So I started when I was a child wanting to be an artist, and I just kind of felt like, you know, that was my place. That I, you know, when I was in school, like, oh, I liked art class, you know, oh, I. I and so when I got into high school, I went to a very small private girls' school. Huh. And um, so I took art as often as I could on my schedule, and I had there was one art teacher there, and uh, she was a potter, and she had me making some things out of clay, and I sort of wanted to veer into clay at that point, but my mother would not allow me to. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny now to look back on it, um, but she didn't want me to go in that direction. I think she 
I don't know. I think she might have felt it was unladylike, or uh -huh. I don't know. She, I don't know her reasons, but. Um, <clears throat> well, it's two so, different. There's two different generations, certainly. I mean. Oh yeah. And obviously, two different. Um, I would frame it this way. It's not the way anybody else would frame it. They're two different epochs. So sometimes in historical time, you have an epoch which is just a long. Epoch is just a long, like for, so for example, in a lot of the 20th century, right. we were in an analog epoch, mm -hmm. whatever analog is, which is things like yeah. the boom box or, right, yeah, yeah. or things like, uh, Not check, <laughs> yeah, checking boxes when you vote and just things like radio, that's yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about historical time is that in a second, that can be obliterated and replaced by a new epoch. Right. It can happen quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is an example of that because you're in the same family. And there's not, in other words, not a lot of time. You're talking about the difference of 20 years. But in those 20 years, you have your own ideas about womanhood or, or art. Uh -huh. And they may have absolutely nothing in common with that epoch. And so it goes. It's almost like a discon yeah. my discontinu what? discontinuity theory of history. Yeah. I've said enough. But that's kind of my... Yeah. yeah, so it's like, why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So any, like, yeah. Well, so <laughs> I wasn't able to, to pursue Clay at different wow. times that I wanted to. You were blocked from doing and, it. And uh, I got blocked, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I did printmaking and I did uh, uh, painting and drawing. Hmm. You know, those sort of 2D classical things. Uh, one summer I went to a um, studio art program up in Andover, Mass, um, at the, the, the school there, Andover. Andover. Um, and uh, I was doing studio art, and they had all these different kinds of art studios. It wasn't just like one room, and people were doing different things. It was like you could go to the ceramics hut, and you know there was a woman there that was a potter, and all these kilns and clays, and people were making porcelain plates. And I was like, Oh my gosh, mom, I want to make porcelain plates. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, Oh no, 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 no. You will not be doing that. And I even had some professor call her. I wanted to, I wanted to do clay and sculpture. You wanted to do what you wanted to do. Right. What you were meant to do and in life. I was like, I want to do three-dimensional stuff. you got to fight for it. You know? Yeah. And she just sh shut me down on that one. <laughs> and um, so I did manage to um, convince her that I could do printmaking. The deal was drawing and painting with her. Like, you needed to do classic, classical art training. Um, so she did allow me to get into the, the printmaking studio and I love, love, love that. And it was very kitchen-y. I, I, like, I like process stuff. I like uh -huh. working with uh, mud and water and, you know, rinsing and I love all that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why I like this so much. Anyway, so, um, so I did the printmaking and then I pursued printmaking more. When I got back to D.C., I, um, our art teacher hooked me up with a program at the um, Portrait Gallery in D.C. That uh -huh. with some printmakers. Yeah. And another student and I studied there, um, which was awesome because we got to skip school one day a week <laughs> and take the metro in and go and work with these printmakers all day oh. for about six weeks, and that was super cool. And then when I was about to go to college... Um, I would not, I didn't apply to any um, of the schools that my mom wanted <laughs> to go to, which were like Collins and Sweetbriar and all these women's colleges. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go to, uh, I wanted, I, I, I desperately wanted to escape my school when I was in high school because mm -hmm. I had been there for so long and I wanted to go to a big public school. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I won't go into all the details, but I ended up going to the School of Design at NC State University. Yeah. And that's where I met Rob. Right. <laughs> and um, I just went down there to visit, and I loved the design school. I loved the fact that it was a small, um, serious little school within mm -hmm. a giant university. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted diversity of yeah. people and all that, and so that's where I ended up. And... Um, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't do, I, and I, there was no clay there as, as academics in the in the design mm -hmm. school. It was the, I did do textile design. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I landed studio wise in school, and so that's how I got interested in quilts and 
And that that also was very kitcheny with all the dyeing and the water baths and you know experimenting with um, different. Uh, I made a lot of things with natural dyes and and really enjoyed that. Um, so I really developed an interest in textiles. But at that school, they really trained people a lot in um, the industry, the textile industry, and um, mm -hmm. you know working for big companies that are. Mm -hmm. Producing T-shirts and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah garments and all that. And I mm -hmm. steered away from that. Mm -hmm. Early on, I took a course up at Penland here in North Carolina, in, in, near here, and I studied up there. And I pretty much decided when I was there, I was like, I'm going to be a studio craftsperson. I, I want to mm -hmm. be making my own work uh, and selling it. That's uh -huh. what I wanted to do. So I was pursuing that. Um, when I first got out of school, I had a friend that started a fanny pack company, and I was working with her um, making fanny packs and helping her sell them at shows and stuff. And then Rob was my boyfriend, and he was, he had started this pottery studio. And honestly, I did not know anything about his background as a potter uh -huh. when we were in school. He swore up and down to himself that he was not going to be a potter. And he didn't really talk about it much. Um, uh -huh. He really didn't. Um, and then once we started dating, he took me up to his parents' place, and there mm. was a party, and a bunch of friends went up there. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, your parents are potters? This is so cool. You know, I love their studio, and and I just was fascinated with it. I had no idea that that was his background. And, um, and that's what you had been looking for, right? That's what you've been wanting well, to do. Well, I mean, they had this kind of lifestyle that it's based I was on what like you wanted, trying, you... aspiring for. Right. And in fact, I even had a boyfriend in college um, who wasn't, he didn't go to our school, but he, I gave him a pottery class as a gift one time, and he took this pottery class, and we were like, wouldn't it be cool if we were potters, and I could decorate the pots, and you, and, and anyway, so he, we broke up before, you know, Rob and I ended up getting, Rob and I had been friends, but we had, we had not been a, a couple until after that relationship ended. And then, and then I found out about this whole pottery thing, a pottery part of his life. Um, but anyway, he, um, he didn't even start being a potter until like a year or a year and a half after he graduated. He got a job and found, I guess he probably told you all about that, but... <laughs> Decided, well, maybe pottery is not such a bad idea anyway. So, um, so he opened up a studio, and I was working in the same building. It was an arts collective, and our friend was doing the fanny pack business in there. And um, Rob had his pottery studio, and I, I, if I wanted to see him, I had to hang out in his studio. And he's yeah. like, oh, can you cut these out for me? And, right. and the next thing I know, I'm like mixing glazes, <laughs> and then. Um, because we had been studio buddies in college uh -huh. and worked late at night together. And that's what you do when you're in design school, is that you just spend a lot of time farting around in the studio with friends and, you know, making things and getting them to help you with, you know, collaborating on stuff. So anyway, so it was, it was like a natural fit. And then the next thing I know, I'm going to shows with him and then... And then we got engaged, and then once, I, I, at the time I was still um, working with my friend and um, doing the fanny pack thing and work, working in a restaurant. Um, and then after we got married, I decided to jump into it full time, which was probably pretty crazy uh -huh. <laughs> way to start out the marriage. Jump in and try to work with somebody as a potter who, he also barely kind of, I mean, he knew how to make pots, but he had never glazed pots. He had never, um, there's many aspects of doing this that he had no acquaintance with. Oh. Because he hadn't, he had like limited tasks that he did in his parents' studio. So we're, I'm, I, um, you know, we fumbled through it <laughs> for a couple of years. It was not pretty. We hmm. fought a lot. Um, oh. I didn't know what I was doing. He kind of knew what he was doing and was trying to show me, and mm. it was tough. But obviously, we've been married for going on 30 years, so mm -hmm. 
it's all worked out fine. <laughs> we raised two children, yeah. and uh, you know, it's um, it's been a good, been a great life for me, and I, I just really uh, am so happy that I landed in clay because it, it really is such a great material to work with, and um, and it's also a uh, as Working as a craftsperson, it's a very uh, affordable material. Mm -hmm. um, you can make a lot of stuff out of with only spending a little bit with of money. With a minimal amount. Yeah. yeah. So as a craft, it's more possible that way. Like jewelry or even fibers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an expensive material to work with. Fiber. A lot of the... Like if you're dyeing linen or yeah, silk, yeah, or linen whatever. can be expensive. I mean, and so, yeah, yeah, and so anyway, um, it's yeah. you can you can make a lot of beautiful things out of with spending just a very small amount of money. So it's been it's been it's easier to make a profit doing it. Would you say you've come full circle then? Because in the beginning you were saying to your mom, I guess. I want to do this, right? You were saying the clay, right? <laughs> yeah. So you, you fa end up doing what you want to do. So that's, yeah. a, that's really great. Yeah, and I mean, I we talked about I... that, too. And she was like, well, maybe, you know, if you had pursued clay, you, would, you might have given it up. Or, you know, like, yeah, you, know, you just, it's yeah. just funny how life works that way. Um, and I had given it up. I had pretty much, you know, gone in a different direction. I had kind of, you know, decided to settle into the whole textile design and fibers world, so. Um, so but, what, yeah. does it, what does it mean when you give something like that up and go into another thing for a time and come back to it or change direction? I only ask that because I'm somebody that always did the same thing decade after decade, and, and if I can help it not change or not change direction, because that's my preference, so what, I'm just trying to understand the other, just like I've never had children, I've never been, there's right. a lot of things in life that are just so important to so many people. Yeah. Do you mind talking a little bit about, is it just, is the change of direction just connected to, well, that's what life is, or yeah. my sibling changed direction, my parents changed direction, that's what you do, you do this. Mm -hmm. Career change, is that, is that kind of, that's what I'm guessing it would be. Is that a strange question, I know, but, but it's, well, it's coming I, from someone you who know, doesn't. You know, I don't think it was really that hard for me, because I was a kid that grew up knowing that I want, was going to be doing something completely different from my family. My dad was an attorney. My oh, mom sure. was a housewife. Yeah, of course. They were very mainstream folks. I mean, of course, you know, upper middle class yeah. folks in the D.C. area. Um, but, and my sister wanted to be an attorney. Oh, man. My brothers were, I was the second child. My brothers were younger than me. They couldn't really figure out what they wanted to do, but they... They were definitely more mainstream folks than I was. Yeah. I kind of was the oddball. <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting, but, but it doesn't really depend on your environment. So I can imagine if you were in a progressive artistic environment and you wanted to be an attorney, you would be the rebel, right? You yeah. would be the non mainstream right. person. So, right? That's kind of why, so it's a, right? I'm uh -huh. just saying there are places like that, though, so it all depends yeah. on where you are. So, right. From the, and of well, course, we you know. We had a kid, we, yeah. we had a child that uh, we called. One of our daughters, she's the youngest, mm -hmm. we always said she was the adult in the thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we were like, oh, she's going to end up selling insurance or, like, having, you know, like, right. having a more mainstream lifestyle or, um, and um, she's actually a scientist. She's mm -hmm. a, in a bio, she was a biology major mm -hmm. and she works at an environmental testing lab and that is her, her niche and she really loves that and yeah. it's a great fit for her. Um, and we always joke about, she's like the most talented one of all of us. She's so artistically talented. It's, really? It's really cool. Do you think there's a connection between biology and artistic practice? Oh, yeah, I do. I think. What are that, your theories about um, that and what the connections might be? Or, I don't, I'm just off well, the top of my head. Well, I think she loves being in a lab because she grew up in here. I think being in a lab, like, yeah. like I was saying, the kitchen-y stuff, like the mixing uh -huh. and the testing and the pouring and... She grew up going to Montessori school and then okay. coming and working in here. So right. I think uh, those processes are taking place in labs. Absolutely. And so the reasons might be different. Right? Yeah, and and measuring it and you know analyzing it and that kind of thing. She loves that. She loves uh, science and math. So science and math. It's a good fit. How are you at science and math? Uh, you know, growing up. <laughs> 
I wasn't really that great at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had went through many years of doing all of our accounting. I actually have a CPA that helps me with it now, but but I, I actually kind of enjoy it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that does that part of our business. I know I was talking to Rob, and Rob's a visual person. He yeah. sees things that I can't see, or people that are yes, less visual. Can. It's like visual intelligence. Um, and I imagine you got that. That's right. So talk about what that is. Or when someone is visually intelligent, like you said, I can look and I see where somebody's sign is off, or the top, the topography of the sign could be better. Or oh, you gosh, can see yeah. that. You know what I'm talking. So explain. It's he has a what, very. He's a very uh, has a very critical eye for sure, and he also. Um, you will think that you're having the most intense conversation with him and he will stop the whole thing so you can look at a bird that he's, and he will be able to identify what bird, is. oh, there's a sandhill crane flying through here right now. Do you realize that? You know, it's like, important. Um, it's important. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I just watched you make this pot. Yeah. So what are you experiencing when you make that? Because, you know, to me, I'm, I'm a lay person. I don't, it was just a lump of clay. It was just, I mean, it had a good shape to it, it as a circle. But the, the thing started to rise, and it had shape to it, and it had a... I know that's... It may seem like a simple thing, but um, what do you, ma what do you make of that? I would say that I am a visual person, um, but I think I'm also a very tactile person. Okay. Like, I, I think that's why this medium is a really good fit for me. Uh, because, like I was saying, the, the whole... Um, Equanimity is something that I'm always seeking, and um, that's what you're doing when you're throwing on the wheel, is creating okay. a form that has equanimity, and otherwise it would be chaotic. Yeah. yeah, it would. And yeah. I mean, there are potters that. And do for that. you, it's touch. So for you, the physical aspect of touching the clay is, is the most is important, right? That's what you're saying. It's yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The feeling of it, the equal pressure that I was showing you, like my hand on the inside, the hand on the outside, equal pressure, um, forming whatever it is that I'm going after, yeah. whether it be a pitcher or a vase or, I mean, there are some things that I make this like twisted pots in there. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit off, but, but they're still centered pieces. Hmm. They're just, you know, just the whole beauty of them is that they're a little twisty at the top. So, um, so the philosophy of equanimity, is that the word? Is that the word you were using? Equanimity, equanimity. is um, something that I, 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 I'm just sort of landing here. And I, I also have studied and practiced yoga for many years. And that's mm -hmm. the whole, that's a very big part of that. Mm -hmm. Is um, being completely balanced and true in different forms. Okay. Um, and uh, not letting a certain situ like in, in yoga like the whole idea of practicing it is you're practicing all these different postures but finding a way to be peaceful and centered in that awkward Posture. position yeah and that's that, equanimity that's equanimity and that, and that point is no longer awkward is that true it becomes something other than awkward or it becomes a means to yeah it becomes a it becomes a relaxed place for you to rest but it takes a lot of practice in all the different form, you know pa postures and is that like this in here yeah I mean the, the pursuit of making it probably took me about and, and I've heard other people say this it takes about seven years of throwing working in clay to actually be able to make, to, to master it or, you know, um, and I, I definitely feel that that was true of me. Um, the first seven years that I was throwing my pots, like they, they might've felt really great when I was making them and then <laughs> when they were done, I was like, Oh God, I don't know. I, I just didn't feel like they were there. You know, like they were really. Now is that now that's a feeling that you have inside of yourself. Yeah, and it's that, does self criticism, it, of course. Well, but. no, but I don't want to. I don't. I'm not saying so. But what I'm, what I was thinking about that is that that's a way. Is that a way for you to know what the next step is in your development? Is that like a guide to the future? Do you know what I mean? So you're saying, well, this is a little bit off, but does that tell you how to change it or what to do next? I, oh yeah, 
So talk yeah, about that. That's interesting. In, so you what? get and you know you get information like oh the bottom is too thick on this or or uh, the top is too thin or the mm-hmm. you know this uh, you know the line on this that I that I paint you know brushed on there didn't. And a lot of that has to do with the process, the glaze being too mm-hmm. thick or thin, or it's very precise huh. ceramics. Um, but I would just say that, you know, as a, as a craft, like, it's just like when you're playing music, mm-hmm. practice it until you can't get it wrong. <laughs> you know, that's what my, I remember when my daughter was studying right. the violin, that's what she would say. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, don't just do it until you get it right and quit. Keep practicing it until you, well, you never get quit. it wrong. Yeah, or you know. I mean, you should, you can't quit because then because you first of all you may want to be able to do it again. Right. If for no re- other I'm reason about, than that. Like, kids learning music. Kids learning. Well, it's the same way. <laughs> you know. Um, and you mean play to go outside? That kind of thing. Quit because I can go outside and right, ride yeah. a bike or something. Um, don't just you know yeah. once you do it right, don't just stop. Yeah, you, you know, can't stop. like keep doing it. Until but I mean, the, the other thing too about stop is that if you do stop, you might lose it. Yeah. You might. So as in a yeah. way, it's not like riding a bicycle in that sense. Yeah. I mean, what I mean, you have to, you have to, so you, so you got to keep, I mean, you don't, have, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to keep doing them all the time. Right. Obsessively, but you want to do it a few more times until you uh-huh. yeah. integrate it into your nervous yeah. system. Is that what right. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and throwing yeah. is very much like that. It's, huh. it's, it's a very much like playing an instrument or, um, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm equating it to that because I know you're a musician. Well, you but know, that, here, here at Journey of an Aesthete, our, our, slo- our slogan is all the arts are one. Yeah. Completely one. Right. All the arts. Medium is secondary mm-hmm. to the spiritual aspect of it, which, yeah, is, and which I think, is unitary. And you agree with that, huh? Yeah. No, yeah. Um, and I think that's where the equanimity thing comes in is like, this is, this is how I achieve. That's how I, you know, what I'm seeking when I'm, when I'm throwing is that feeling. So... Well, thank you, Beth. I'm really, You're uh, very welcome. I'm glad you took the time to yeah. talk about this stuff because some some people might think it's a little technical or wonky. Yeah. Um, well, I like to get wonky. About I do too. Other well, I was just gonna say. I mean, to me, this is uh, a the most easy. interesting thing in the world. Yeah. Well, it's about um, this, uh, it's uh, it's so interesting. You know, you get so sidetracked by so many little um, problems that come up in your work and. Uh, you, know, you want to tell you me about this Elvis, Elvis poster <laughs> behind you in Maine? That was Rob's grandmother. That's right. She had that in she her uh, in her oh, apartment, <laughs> and he, she loved her so much. Well, sure. Yeah, yeah and um, she didn't have very much stuff in the end, and we found that in her closet, and we were like, "Oh, we're we're gonna have to take that with us." Mm-hmm. She went to go see him a few times. Bless by Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Beth. You're welcome. You're very welcome.